Hi, I'm Nico. I'm a senior technical marketing engineer at Isovalent. And I'm Raphael, also working with Nico at Isovalent. So Raphael, can you tell me a bit about cluster mesh today? So cluster mesh is a yeah, pretty, pretty common use case of Cilium with the idea of actually extending the, the data plane between multiple Kubernetes clusters. It can be two, it can be three or more. That sounds a bit like federation, Kubernetes federation. That's yeah, I think world. a lot of people think of federation when they think cluster mesh, but actually it's very different because in federation you actually try to mesh multiple uh, Kubernetes control planes, which has all kinds of implications on you know latency, breaking the, mm -hmm. the, the control planes of the clusters, whereas here we're only meshing the data planes actually. So the Kubernetes clusters stay entirely separated and they actually don't know about the mesh. Only mm -hmm. the Cilium agents know about the mesh and exchange information. Right, so what, what kind of, uh, how does it work and what's, what's the components in the background to make it work? Well, essentially it's the, it's the, the Cilium agents, right? The Cilium agents have access to read-only data from other clusters and doing this, they can actually change information, so read-only information. And this can be information related to the backends for the services, for load balancing, it can be encryption keys to encrypt between the pods, uh, it can be network policies to secure traffic between pods in multiple clusters, or just just uh, identity information, so uh, you can have observability between pods in different clusters. Okay, so some of the use cases you just mentioned was uh, network policy yeah. across clusters, right? So you get this kind of consistent network policies across multiple clusters. Is that right? Yeah, there's consistency, but there's also the fact that let's say you have you have a service running in one cluster and another service running in another cluster, and if you don't ca have cluster mesh you would typically go uh, with a north-south load balancer in order to have them communicate, which means you need authentication, authorization in order to secure the traffic between the two components. Mm -hmm. Whereas here, you can just have them communicate east-west uh, as if they were in the same cluster and secure the traffic using actual Kubernetes metadata, using labels with right. network policies that actually make sense in, in Kubernetes. So you don't need to think of what's outside of Kubernetes when you do this. Okay. And you also mentioned encryption. Can we also encrypt the traffic between clusters that are meshed by cluster mesh? Or? Yeah, that's totally possible. So you can actually exchange keys uh, such that the, the, the encryption, so in Cilium you have pod to pod encryption which happens node to node. So only when traffic goes from one node to another node between pods communicating, you encrypt the traffic. Mm. And this can be done totally transparently when you have multiple clusters in a mesh. And again, the thing is Kubernetes doesn't even know about it, doesn't care about it. So the pods have the, uh, the, the, the idea, it looks to the pods as if they're part of the same cluster, but there's no implication on the latency uh, for the, the control plane. Got it, okay. And what about observability? Can you see traffic that is coming from one cluster to another, or how does it work together with? Yeah, so in each cluster, we can have a Hubble instance that actually allows to observe what's happening in the cluster. And when traffic comes from another cluster or goes to another cluster, we'll have an extra bit of information that says this comes from this pod in this cluster. Right. So typically either on the CLI or in the Hubble UI, you actually have a little label that says this traffic comes from the other cluster. Okay. So we've covered a few different use cases. Do you want to recap some of the things we can do then with, uh, with cluster mesh? Because we've talked about... Well, there's, yeah, there's a lot of things. I think in general, it allows to simplify a lot of the architecture that is linked to multi-cluster or multiple environments, multiple VPCs, for example. Very often we see, uh, we see companies where Kubernetes was adopted by multiple teams and they have one cluster that was started in AKS, one in EKS, one on-premises, and when they, they start actually integrating the different services, they have to go through some kind of north-south load balancing with authorization and so on. So this can greatly simplify and secure even better the traffic between the clusters by allowing the pods to communicate as if they were part of one data plane without having an impact on the actual control plane logic. Right, so it's totally transparent to the totally actual transparent, yes. users and developers. Okay, and how, does it, how do you configure it? Do you have to configure your services and what do you have to do to enable this functionality? In, in, in right, so you first need to uh, enable cluster mesh on each of the clusters. And what this does is that they will start a new API server that is read-only 
to expose the metadata that can be exchanged between the clusters. Mm -hmm. And then once you have done this and all the clusters are matched, so you will exchange the information so that the, the clusters can match with each other. Uh, usually in production, you'll use a load balancer in front of this API server for each cluster. Uh, and point each of the cluster to the API server of the other clusters so that they start exchanging information. And once this is done, essentially you'll be able to deploy, um, for example, services that are global. And the great thing is we don't add a new CRD. So Cilium essentially will use the standard service definition with just some annotations that say this service is global okay. and this service has a local affinity, for example. Uh, and so, so by affinity, do you mean like we can force the traffic to go a certain way and maybe a different way or? Yeah, so once you have a service that is global, so, so that's one of the benefits of service mesh, right? Is that you can have a load balancer that actually redirects to pods that are in multiple clusters just by deploying a service with the same name in the same namespace in different clusters that are meshed. But the problem then is you're like, well, okay, so I can have a service that redirects to pods in multiple cluster, but how about the latency that will result? Not mm. latency linked to control plane, but to the traffic itself, right? Yeah. This is not really great. In most cases, what you want actually is kind of a fallback logic. And you can have a fallback logic by using a local affinity. So with a local affinity, the service will redirect to local endpoints, uh, unless there's no local endpoints available, in which case it will redirect to a distant one, to a remote one at a different cluster. Okay. You can do the same with a remote affinity, actually. So it's just the opposite logic. You will always redirect to a remote cluster unless there's no remote backend available, in which case you redirect locally. Okay. And how many clusters can you kind of join together? Are there some limits? Or what do you see customers using uh, cluster mesh? To what, to what scale do they do it? So mo most people use cluster mesh on, on a handful of clusters, usually. But you can actually scale to multiple hundreds of clusters. Um, that is that is totally possible, um, and there's there's lots of use cases. So again, it can be just two clusters, just for a replication of services. Uh, there's people that actually use it because they have like one service that is uh, stateful, like a database, for example, that they cannot scale on multiple uh, uh, infrastructure, yeah. on multiple uh, providers, for example, and then multiple services that they want to scale, uh, one at Google, one at Amazon, and so on. So they'll have at least three clusters, uh, two for the the stateless. Uh, services and one for the stateful service. Yes. Uh, so there's lots of different architectures depending on what you want to achieve. Cool. And I guess any reasons why you wouldn't use it, right? You have multiple clusters or? Hmm, that's a good question. Well, if there's no reason why your services need to talk to each other, okay. right? <laughs> then there's no point in, in making an architecture complex for no reason. Yeah. Right. Right. Well, thanks very much for your time. Thank and, you. And uh, thanks everyone for watching. <laughs>